like to take. I have uh, some warm chocolate from Ghana here. Um, golden tree chocolate drink. Yeah. I can oh, see. I'll go for the chocolate. I love good quality chocolate. So ah, please. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I go for the coffee in, in a proper Dutch mug, as you can see. <laughs> uh, and of course, it's Ethiopian coffee, where I, up until a year and a half ago, I lived in Ethiopia, and they have the absolute best coffee. So, okay, uh, we're not going to have a fight between Ghana and Ethiopia. <laughs> but we will talk about agriculture and Africa and women. Uh -huh. Isn't it, Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. I, because I, 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 I really like the idea of talking about food agriculture. And I like the fact that we started with cocoa from Ghana and <laughs> coffee from Ethiopia. So yes, I'm in for it. Let's talk about this. Yeah. So I'm interested, you know, as you know, Rebecca and, and uh, Kitty also knows this, we have 115 nationalities at marketing and I'm always very proud of that number. Mm. So you're from Ghana, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly what your research is about. So, so tell me in a few words, uh, why are you at Wageningen? I know you studied in Ghana and in California before at Irvine. So why Wageningen? Yeah, so I came to Wageningen because of the, the, my quest for innovation. Um, when I was studying my master's degree and I conducted a field research in Ghana, I came across one of the communities where someone did a research and it was very innovative. Once I got there, they said they kept mentioning the person's name all across. So I decided to find out more about Wageningen University. And it's all about innovation. I said, I'm going to do my PhD here. And I like to have a PhD that is action research oriented. Now in my PhD, I focused on digitalization of climate smart agriculture information. I work basically in the Volta Delta of Ghana. And our Delta is not like the Netherlands where you have so much water because of the hydrological constructions upstream from Burkina Faso and then the Akosinbo yeah. Dam, the water is extracted. So in the Delta, they, they produce vegetables basically for the urban market in Accra, Tema, and sometimes export. But variability in weather condition is a challenge. And so they have to depend on the weather to decide on how much crop to cultivate, when to cultivate, mm -hmm what type of chemical and when to even apply the agrochemicals. I did some survey at the beginning and I realized that there was a challenge with the use of weather information to support their decision making. Yeah, yeah they nice. depend on their local knowledge, for example, mm -hmm. when they see the bed, like yeah. in around this time when it's spring, the mango tree, when there are a lot of flowers on the mango tree, it tells that in the season, there's going to be a lot of rainfall. But if we have sparse flowers at a certain portion of the tree, it means this season they're going to be intermittent dry spell. That sounds really like a, a nice location specific model of uh, climate smart agriculture, which uh -huh. can be CCAPS is all about, and, and yeah. the conference that you hosted last January. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I think, I mean, when, when people talk about climate, still too many people focus on the mitigation side, right? Bringing uh, the emissions down. But for developing countries, particularly, one of the most urgent tasks that we have is to adapt to unavoidable climate change. It's already there. It's happening yeah. and it's impacting lives and livelihoods. So I'd be really interested in, in hearing from you, uh, Rebecca. We just had a, a global conference on mm -hmm. climate adaptation, a world summit, and all the leaders promised we need to do more on adaptation. Mm -hmm. How would you say we can do this in a way that's both locally relevant, but mm -hmm. also gender sensitive, because I think those two elements will be the key to successful adaptation. Yeah, I, I will give my answer in relation to my innovation, which I conducted in the Adan, that is in the Volta Delta. So as I was telling about my story, so when I collected these local images, so it is for the farmers, it's just about stories talking about the dew, talking about the appearance of the beds. But I saw that this is an opportunity to co-create a usable information to support decision-making. Because at the end of the day, you realize that if there is no information, then, then when there's outbreak of pest or disease, it, it just happens sadly. But if you could tell how much, a, provide a reliable information, then farmers can be able to make informed decision concerning how much, what type of crop. So I put these stories into a digital web-based app. Now, this is where I come in with the, the role of women. 
there was no use of smartphone among the women. Most of them depend on men for information. And I try to en engage the women in the study. So I put this web base up on a platform a smartphone, train the farmers, train the women one-on-one. -on -one. Touch this. When you see a bed, just touch. So it's a simple design approach. So this is about also including, if you want to be inclusive, we want to talk about being in, including the local people into our broad-based agricultural program. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't think about innovation so broad, far away from the local farmer. Innovation mm -hmm. should come to the steps or very close to the farm. I like, the, I like the concept of inclusive innovation. I think that's, that's really true mm -hmm. and it's definitely as today is, is International Women's Day, it's very appropriate to think of women. Um, my concern is also that we are not even inclusive in training women for new technologies. Um, yeah. You know, there, there are few two women, too few women engineers. Mm -hmm. And I really would like to, to use this platform also to encourage girls to study something like you do, information science, or to become a hydraulic engineer or a soil engineer, because we need the women to work with the women in the field mm -hmm. to really uh, get to a new level of innovation. And innovation doesn't always need to be um, you know, the very small scale. We, we really should think about breakthroughs. And for example, in the case of Ghana, one of the things that, that I would immediately think of is how can we use solar energy to direct little pumps that can actually bring the water just to tie over the crop for a few days. And those are, they're very sophisticated, but the application is very concrete. Mm -hmm. And I really think that, that having more women to work in these fields will also help women farmers and, and be more inclusive also for different ethnic groups and so on. Yeah, certainly I agree with you, Louise. Because at the end of the day, when you observe in my study area, everything is about men, the agricultural model, the extension model says lead farmer. And who is a lead farmer? The lead farmer is a man. But then I, I go because the lead farm, the lead farmer approach is about educated farmer, uh, an outspoken farmer. But who says a woman is not an outspoken uh, farmer? Who says a woman can't adopt and also spread information? So I said, no, a woman can do also just as a man is able to do. So I selected some few women and I give a story about a woman whom I will not, that's not a, a real name, Auntie Janet, I will just say Janet. Um, she said, I have, not, have never been to school. How, I don't know how to use your type of machine. She used the word machine referring to the smartphone. I said, you can do it. So with mm -hmm. training, how, home visits, field visits, she, was, she became very active. She was one of those people who would send information, her observation to collaborate with the scientific forecast that we were producing. Mm -hmm. So she became very active, but what did she do? I taught her how to use the images. And if you want to send information, the smartphone, you just use the, like the WhatsApp, the emoji, or you use the voice recorder. And so we started with, we started with basic things that are available to mm -hmm. us to integrate or to improve yeah, that's very into interesting. the process. Kitty, how can, can policy help here? Because this is one case, but what you really want is uh, a kind of upscaling so that we get these climate smart solutions everywhere and they don't depend just on Rebecca and, and her project. Yeah, I think upscaling, I mean, let me first answer, if, if I may, uh, Louise, a little bit more on, on the gender, since it's such a special day of uh, the International yeah. Women's Day. And I'm, I'm completely with Rebecca that we need to be gender sensitive. I'd like to even broaden that more because I think it needs to be gender sensitive across the world, right? So in the technology that you use, so what you, whether it's a solar power, digitalization, it's also in the institutional setting in which we work. Right, women also mm. often don't have land tenure. Right, agricultural extension services are male dominated and focused on males, but also in terms of the finance. Mm -hmm. Right, getting uh, a micro insurance scheme, for example, women often don't have a bank account or a collateral. But these are the women from a poverty perspective that I want to reach with locally relevant adaptive um, solutions. I think what we have done in, in the Netherlands is work through, and many of them together with the innovative power that Wageningen brings, we have brought together private sector actors, academia, and public sector policymakers to try and really scale, because 
what and and scaling must be done locally relevant right it's not just bringing one solution and bringing them to many but making sure that that solution is context specific and what works in ghana may not work in gambia yeah, what yeah. works in mali may not work in malawi so scaling must take into account context specific and i think what we're trying to build out is a solution uh, toolkit that through the financial means that we make available in development cooperation, we can scale faster. We're trying to make that private sector relevant and private sector can be the mom and pop store, right? It doesn't have to be big private sector like Unilever, but it can also be small and local mm -hmm. so that the market itself starts to work on these solutions and make them um, as the motor, I would say, of, of driving the innovation through to the ground level. Yeah, uh, from my perspective, it's so very important that these solutions be driven by science and evidence. Absolutely. Because, uh, we have in the past had so many disasters of white elephants, of things that didn't work, that didn't work in the African context or in the Asian mm -hmm. context. And so an evidence-based interface mm -hmm. for science and policy would be really important. And, and I think that is something that we are trying to also promote now in the preparations for all the World Food Systems Summit that will take in September, place in September, as, as you know, where yeah. I think our take should be that, that government, science, and all levels should work together to get the best solutions and be inclusive. So it's not just about information or, or giving data. It's not mm -hmm. just about innovation, but it should also be inclusive innovation and inclusive data or information. And that is a package I think would be very strong in an evidence-based uh, science policy interface. So I was wondering, Kitty, whether that's something that resonates with you also? Yes, very much. I mean, that's why we have pushed very hard, obviously, together with Wageningen, to get a food system summit organized and to basically make sure that what we have in the climate arena, where we have the IPCC and we have a, a sort of a solid base of science from which to work and from which to uh, get common agreement on the goals and the targets that we set ourselves, we don't really have that in the food System, which is which is absurd if you see how many lives and livelihoods depend on this, how much of the economy is driven by agriculture, right? And so the Food Systems Summit, for me, really brings all those things together in a coherent package, but driven by science, driven by data, so we can also, as global actors, all of us, be held accountable for the progress that we will start to make, hopefully, after the Food Systems Summit is done. And that, I think, the biggest conundrum that we have is one, making sure we have the right relevant science available at the summit, but also making sure that science keeps informing right. where we are going along the road after the Food System Summit. And that the women that Rebecca works with have access to the science. So it's exactly. extremely good, Rebecca, I think that you are in the forefront of, of building those bridges. But mm -hmm. I want to see many more sci scientists from Ghana men and women, but also at other levels, you know, the sort of intermediate levels are very important, yes. just the engineers, but, but we need to really train everybody in thinking along those lines that Kitty just sketched. So it's, it's not about short term solutions, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. really about finding the toolkit, finding the, the elements that can work and, and also that can help us to exchange experiences so that not everybody needs to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And, and that brings us out of our sometimes little box bubble or comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. To give you one example from my own experience, we were working on adaptation programs in Ethiopia up in the north, uh, high variability of precipitation, changing patterns, really people's lives at risk. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, many donors and, and local actors were doing wonderful things, but all in a very local setting until we started to think, but what is the driver for precipitation change? And then if you look at sort of the watershed tower of East Africa, of the Horn of Africa, it is the Congo Basin. Yeah. If we keep chopping down the Congo Basin, we can do all the adaptation we want in uh, the north of Ethiopia, and we're still not going to bring women of Ethiopia the perspective of a dignified life, right? So getting the science to make sure that it, things are connected mm -hmm. to the different fields is incredibly important and I really hope that the Food System, system Summit can bring that type of holistic, integrated, coherent perspective, but then also make sure, as, as Louise said, that it comes down to the ground level. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Rebecca? Is that the yeah. future? Are you yeah. going to contribute to this? 
it, it's certainly it's possible, you know, as, as you've all contributed earlier on, it's, it's about thinking systemic, thinking holistically. And sometimes in, in the drive for innovation for food systems, and I like the word food system, some aspect of, of the system may seem irrelevant, but mm. they are the, the driving force. It's, it's more or less like um, in my class, in my MSB class, when we have the problem tree, the bigger problems are always seemingly visible, but the, the driving forces that rather cause the bigger problems are silent and they are the root causes. So if we could tackle these issues about women, how to integrate women, always not always think that, okay, then we give the information to the men, we give the technology to the men, the lead farmers, I mean, thinking broadly about involving um, the stakeholders at the district assembly, the men, and so on. But then we think about the basic issues like someone saying, I can't do it, but you say, I can train you. I can involve you. These are the packages that I have for you. Then it's, it starts from there. So I also think, I also go with Kitty who said, who talked about the context. We need to also think about the context. What is the context of the Ghanaian women even, in the even, South? Yeah, even the packages, Rebecca, I think may need to be adapted because we also know that, that women are, have their own way of being creative and that sometimes, okay. especially in RT mm -hmm. um, or in other fields of, of, of technical engineering, uh, there's only one pathway and it's one way of thinking. And I'm not saying that all the men are like that, but there is a <laughs> dominant um, uh, paradigm. There are no men listening right now. So <laughs> dominant paradigm here, whereas, whereas it's, it's really important that we also are inclusive in terms of solutions. So there may be more pathways leading to the right kind of solution. And by opening up the possibility of having an exchange of experiencing and, and trying out experimenting with different solutions, mm -hmm. we are also inclusive in a different way. We're not only talking about gender, but about the fact that human creativity takes many, many roads mm -hmm. and that we don't always know which one is the best. And that I I think in, in, in development work where you have the interaction between the local condition, the science, which is supposed to be global, mm -hmm. policy, which is local, national, regional, we need to be able to, to juggle these creativities. So I'm also interested in training people, men mm -hmm. and women, yeah. to be creative in a new way, to tackle mm -hmm. these multidisciplinary, multifaceted things that you are talking about, Kitty, because that's to me is the yeah. important thing. But I think, I mean, that's uh, maybe that's the only silver lining I would say that I see from the COVID-19 crisis mm -hmm. is that it has led to a big push in digitalization and that also created a democracy if you will in, in international uh, communication so everybody not everybody but many more people now have access so for example the climate adaptation summit that we hosted it had a reach beyond our wildest dreams because everybody could just log in everybody who has access to of course electricity a laptop uh, and and Wi-Fi. So that certainly isn't everybody, but you, what you can see, you can share lessons, you can compare best practices in a visual way, in a, in a low cost way, so much more easily now than we could do, let's mm -hmm. say 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the same goes, Rebecca, you were referring to digitalization, but what we can do through science by giving farmers sort of upfront information about weather conditions that are coming up as to when to plant, when to harvest, that will really make a big difference in people's lives and livelihoods. So I do believe that we are also at the cusp, now that we see food isn't this, but food is actually this, it's everything we touch. Yeah. Yeah. With the new way of thinking, which is more science infused, but also democratic in its, its reach potential, mm -hmm. maybe we can finally start to make the big difference that we need to make a dent in S achieving SDG too, because we're a long way off track. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's a nice last wish for SDG too. Do you have any last wish, Rebecca? Something you really wanted to see? I I want in 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 the coming years. I did like to see more women involved, not only in information, but we're talking about technology in various forms: seed sector, technology in food production, technology in the marketing of food, taking the lead in the export. I did like to see the involvement of women at various stages. And just as um, Louise said earlier on, you know, women are innovative in their own way. 
women can spread information, women can, can adapt the information to their own context beyond your widest imagination. So in the coming year, I want to see more women involved, specifically from Africa. It's, it's uh, the mindset about women going higher in education. It's, there's so much context issue. If perhaps if you get so much into this, you may not get married. There are cultural issues. You know, like I gave an example of the woman, she was afraid of venturing into something that is known to be a man's context because workshops and so on are men dominated. So in the coming years, I, I hope and I look forward to seeing more women in the food, agriculture, climate sector, driving the force. I couldn't agree more. As somebody who went to study food and agriculture and was the only girl in the class at the time in first year university at Wageningen, I've seen right. things change a lot. But as a, as a last note, I would like to say also, I firmly believe in the creativity of women to tackle this. Of course, mm -hmm. together with men, together with society as a whole, and to be evidence-based. But the most important, what we should say to the outside world is if we do not tackle this, if we do not tackle agriculture and food, this will be such a disadvantage to women because mm -hmm. it's women who are the first ones to suffer from inadequate food supply. Their children will suffer. They will not be able to be full participants in society. They will not be able to, to have the important creative role that they have. So it's absolutely essential for the future that we tackle food and agriculture issues in the largest possible way in a climate context and involve women both as the creative brains and mm -hmm. as the first beneficiaries. So here Who we are there, Now I want to dare anyone who listens to this to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs>